Sure. Okay, hello. Thank you for coming. My name is Jessica Sargent. I'm the student body president here at ISU, and I'm here to introduce our candidate that we have with us today. Um, Dr. Robert Marley currently serves as the provost and executive vice chancellor at the Missouri University of Science and Technology and is a professor in the engineering management and systems engineering department. Marley began his professional career as a rehabilitation engineering anal analyst at the Cerebral Palsy Research Foundation, where he helped design adaptive te technologies for severely disabled adults. He pursued research questions in ergonomics and human factors engineering challenges related to cumulative trauma disorders. Marley joined Montana State University in 1990 in the Mechanical and Industrial Engineering Department and went on to hold positions as Associate Dean and the, the Associate Dean and then Dean of the College of Engineering at MSU and later as Interim Vice President of Student Success. In 2012, Marley was selected to join the prestigious ACE Fellows Program for Leadership Development serving at Texas A&M University. In his leadership roles, Marley has led numerous initiatives to increase student and faculty success. Results include enrollment growth, increases in research, new programs and facilities, as well as prominent national and international awards for students and faculty. He has also helped secure approximately $114 million in new private, state, and federal support for various programs and facilities. Marley holds a BS in general studies, as well as an MS and PhD in industrial engineering from Wichita State University. He and his wife, Margaret, who holds a BS in microbiology, reside in Rolla, Missouri, where they enjoy many outdoor activities. So please welcome Dr. Robert Marley. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. <laughs> Great applause. Well, thank you all for joining me. Um, I know it's a busy day, busy time of the busy time of the day, and so, uh, you all know students especially are very busy, so I appreciate those of you who could join me. <clears throat> so this will be a casual conversation. I want it to be very, very interactive. I want to uh, touch, I'm going to fill in some details uh, there uh, with things that, uh, that you're able to read in my bio, and I appreciate that introduction. One of the things that uh, I know I'm going to first address, and I knew it would be the burning question on everyone's mind when they saw my name on the finalist role is the burning question of what was the search committee thinking? So Jessica, you gotta take some, you'll have to take some credit for this or, or blame. What was the search committee thinking? They've asked a dead reggae star to come be a, pre a presidential candidate. Um, so you'll understand a little bit why I introduced myself as Robert, okay, as opposed to Bob. And uh, also goes, um, you wouldn't know this, but uh, my father-in-law is a Bob, my father is a Bob, three of the four of my first bosses in my professional career were Bob's. So I've always introduced myself as Robert just to kind of keep things distinguished from other folks around me that were, uh, that were also, that went by a more familiar name, and that's fine. But you can call me anything you'd like, uh, call me. This, that's all I ask. So I'm going to, uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm already getting a little bit of scratchy voice, so pardon me, I'm going to dip into a little bit of water here and there. But just to kind of uh, jump off the... Uh, uh, introduction and and for just a few minutes. I don't have a PowerPoint. Uh, someone once told me when I did a similar thing, a 10 minutes, 10, 12 minutes introduction, the only thing that can fail is me. The PowerPoint won't fall and it's not going to fail. Um, so I started off, uh, it, it, I will tell you, I was nominated for this position. I couldn't have been more excited when that happened. Pocatello area is familiar to me. The university is familiar to me. I will kind of get into that if we have time for more questions. But uh, having lived in the Northern Rockies for nearly 25 years in Bozeman, um, I told some groups this morning that, you know, if you didn't like winters, you got, you got to go somewhere else. Okay, we like this part of the country, my wife and I. And when this when this position became open, uh, someone else was familiar with me. They nominated me. I couldn't be more excited. And so, um, and even more excited to be here today. At this at this point in time, being considered for your presidency, so um, getting used to the feedback here. One of the things that I want to share with you is is, and I, I know you've heard this already, but this is an institution that does have tremendous potential. There is uh, I see great uh, national international uh, uh, programs, high quality faculty, great students, and. 
uh, really on the verge of breaking out into to a national prominence. Okay, now I'm going to avoid use, using the term rankings just because that kind of connotates different things, but we can include that in the discussion. But I, what I'm really referring to is national presence of the university. Idaho State University has the quality faculty, quality students, many quality facilities, not all. you got some infrastructure issues to deal with. That's, that's clear. But uh, this should be a greater recognized university. And that's going to be one of my priorities is to work on that. Um, and I think it's a goal that, that I'm hearing folks talk about, um, maybe in different ways, but I see some commonality there. I see the need for greater support privately, okay? Private fundraising in public universities is the reality today. Great state universities are not advancing without more private support. It's just, it's just the way it is. Um, and, so, and, and that along with uh, building faculty and student success is how we're gonna get there. So what do I bring to the table, okay? Having, uh, I will tell you, I served, um, as was mentioned in my introduction, came through the ranks, started out as assistant professor at Montana State, rose through the ranks, served the longest, in fact, the job, that I, job title that I've held the longest in my life was dean of engineering at MSU. And, and it's a job that I, I, I reveled in. I really enjoyed it, okay? I left it for a number of reasons because I think sometimes it's time for someone else to come along and take it to the next level. But uh, I also got interested in what I could do in, in, in other, help other universities uh, solve similar, similar issues. So along the way, uh, I did a fellowship at Texas A&M, which was mentioned. One of the things that I was examining, if you're familiar with that program, the ACE Fellows Program, it's a leadership development uh, program that um, you go in with an educational objective in mind and, and you study that along with a number of other things along the way. I was interested, along with my president at, at Montana State, who's still there, of looking at the relationships between a, a research, um, the research central university in the state and how it interacts with other regional institutions in the state. There was a reason for that because of the way the structure was in Montana. She was looking for assistance in, in helping uh, kind of manage those relationships because there was a formal relationship. And I was kind of acting in a, in a ad hoc capacity of that already. So that was my educational objective at Texas A&M. One of um, 11 campuses, but clearly the in College Station campus, clearly the, the center point of, of, that, uh, of that research mission. Great experience. And I came back at a time when um, a, an individual who had been a long-standing vice president for student success um, became ill and, and stepped out of that office. And the president said, I, as you're coming back, in fact, she tried to get me to come back a bit early, uh, said, I need your assistance because you've got the long-standing leadership role on this campus. We've got some issues to resolve in this, in this area. I'd like for you to come back as, as vice president for student success. That wasn't something I was looking at as a career, but uh, if, I shared this with the president a little bit ago. <clears throat> Dr. Cruzado is a small person by stature, but she has mighty strong hands. She twists them arm very nicely. I said, I would love to help. So I, I served in that capacity for a year. It was, a, it was an interesting year. This was when Title IX was really um, becoming a major center point of discussion and concern on campuses. And uh, there was a number of other things that were going on. Uh, athletics was moving in Division I athletics, moving towards uh, reporting directly to the president. Many institutions, including ours at the time, the athletics office would, the athletic director specifically, would report to, in fact, reported to the vice president for student success. That was changing. That was a lot of that. It was the outcome of Penn State and the situation at Penn State. So uh, that was a that was an interesting year. I learned. I did learn a lot, and I I, I was very thankful for that opportunity. But Missouri S and T came calling, and what they were looking for was someone to do a couple things. One was they were reintroducing the dean's level of administration. Remember, I. They were reintroducing, yeah, the, the, there was not a, they didn't have deans, okay? And uh, my predecessor, the previous provost, all of the chairs, the department heads, directors, vice provosts of a number of kinds, all reported directly to the provost. Okay, yeah, there wasn't, so there wasn't an engineering dean, not an engineering, not a dean of business, not a dean of that. It had been eliminated years before, 
as a part of a cost-cutting measure. And um, to some degree successful in that arena, but it was really unsuccessful in terms of leadership development within the university. Fundraising fell off. Rankings fell off because they're one of the major factors in, the, in an institutional ranking is when you have peers, peer deans, peer chairs, they know, you know, if you're the, if you're the dean of, of, tell me your, your background real quickly. Well, doesn't matter. I was going to try to use an example. Say you're the dean of, some, of a discipline and I'm your, I'm a colleague of yours, how we interact with each other. That has a lot to do with how am I rank your institution. Okay. In the, in the U.S. news, that's, that, that's a big factor. Okay. I sure, sure. <laughs> so the the bottom line is it, it hurt the institution not having that that representation. People can talk about um, deans, you know, and sometimes some deans are popular, some deans are not popular. It's just a matter of there's an important role for that officer. Okay. They didn't have that. So I had an opportunity to come help reinstate as founding deans new new administrators. And so that was I saw that as a great challenge. And there was a number of other things that we were working on. Rapid growth, that institution has doubled in its enrollment since early, since about 2004. Has doubled, there are about 9,000 students right now. It was down to less than 4,000 students in, in about, two, I think, 2004. And, and now the job was to maintain that and kind of, we're still on a very slow growth in pattern. Uh, but the, 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 the quality of students is at all time high. And that's another thing we were uh, challenged to try to continue. So I bring that, I bring that um, experience in fundraising. I've been very successful. I'm fortunate to be successful in, in uh, about $30 million directly for support in areas such as the first six named professorships in the College of Engineering at Montana State were at the result of work I had done ranging from about a half a million dollars to $5 million endowment. I was um, played a major role in the development of a, of a $50 million gift to the university. It was the largest private gift uh, to a state entity in Montana uh, still to this day for the Asburonson Innovation Center at uh, Montana State. And, and also the part making up the $114 million that was, that was mentioned earlier, we did a number of projects uh, for uh, federal earmarks and things that we brought to the table to assist the university. So I'm experienced in that, experience in building diversity within my college, within the university. A uh, number of women faculty in the in an engineering college, I increased by fivefold while I was dean. We became going from virtually you count the number of minorities in my college on one hand uh, when I became dean to becoming the number five producer in the nation of Native American engineers and computer scientists. And, and that, was, um, that was our largest minority population in the state. And frankly, we weren't serving them very well. And that was something that I took on as a very serious mission. The uh, faculty success uh, had a threefold increase in research. And, and that uh, led to the university overall growing in research capacity to where we became recognized in 2006 as a, uh, in the highest tier of Carnegie rankings uh, in, in uh, university settings. So that, that was very special. So I had, these are the things that I kind of bring with me. I've been a cabinet member now for three different chancellors, uh, two different institutions with the student success office, now with my role as, uh, as provost. And uh, with, with the, um, the, the job here at Idaho State, like I said, the location, the institution just seemed like I could not resist um, kind of dropping my name in the hat, so to speak, and very glad to be here. And I think I've probably, yeah, probably used enough enough time about me. I want to, so I talked about, um, you know, why I think, why this is a great institution, a little bit about me and what I bring with me and why I'm interested. So I think those are often the spread of questions that you might ask, but let me, anything else you want to know about me, please just jump in. Please step up to the mic. It's not like people can't normally hear me, so. <laughs> Is this on? Is it? Okay. Um, so you mentioned raising enrollments. Yes, sir. We have declining enrollments and we have a toxic relationship between the faculty and the current president, disbanded the faculty senate. Uh, we do have deans. Um, yep. Met a so, few today. 
can you give me some indication about how you, what steps you would take to increase enrollment here mm -hmm. and how to repair the relationship between the president's office and the yeah. faculty? Two, two big questions and, and, and a little bit different each. Let me take on both. So in terms of enroll, in the realm of enrollment management, uh, today, in today's market, in fact, uh, Brian Sagendorf back here is chasing down an answer to a question I've posed. None of the major state universities that have seen increases or managed to maintain their relationships uh, or enrollments, I should say, have done so alone. This, it's, a, it's a highly dynamic, complex process. Reason being is because every other institution is trying to do the same thing, okay? And some are successful, some are not. It's not quite a zero-sum game, but it, you can think of it that way. So if somebody's growing, somebody's shrinking, vice versa. So you, you have to partner with um, some firms that specialize in knowing where students are, knowing what's going to take to get, get students. And, and we partner with a company that actually on a daily basis is providing updates as to today, um, if you're wanting to recruit the, you know, the National Merit Scholar or if you're wanting to recruit a student from Iowa or from Arkansas, it's obviously my current institution, I'm sure you would want to do that, right? Um, but it, you, you name an area, what it's going to take to get that student out of their home institution. Okay, so for example, in Utah, what's the University of Utah offering? What's the University, what's Utah State offering in terms of tiered scholarships that they may offer? Because they vary very frequently. I shouldn't say day to day, but they vary a lot. That's a lot to manage. And so there, there, there are partners uh, that uh, specialize in this. And so I would say, in fact, the greatest thing that I've, or I should say the most relevant thing that I've heard mentioned one time was, it's gonna take some investment to, to make an to, to realize an investment on that. The investment being more students returning to this university, it's gonna take a little bit of effort to invest in the, in the right process by which we can then shape our new class to say we want, to optimize revenues, but also, also to optimize the kind of students we want coming here. And that's, you know, there's a great staff here, an enrollment management staff, but it is a very complex environment changing daily. And so I will look to, I will look to, um, to that office and probably look to some, some assistance from external sources to get us to the right stage. It is a multi-year investment because it's also students, probably ask you guys, probably made your choice, at least within a, a small margin of error, when you were juniors at least in high school, probably sophomores. That's, so that's who you need to be talking to. Okay, some suggest even middle school. Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of set that aside, but it's, it's a doable thing. I think this is a great sell. You have a great location. I've heard people say, no, our location hurts us, Pocatello. I don't think so. I don't think so at all. It's, you're at the crossroads of two great areas. You're close to, to recreational areas. You're, you're close to um, major population centers. And I say close to, anybody from Salt Lake area generally defined? There are, um, I can guarantee you, there are parents there and students who wanna go to college, but they wanna be a little bit away from mom and dad, <laughs> okay? But not really far, you know, not across the country far. And I think Pocatello would be a great location. Safe location, so moms and dads like it. It's a safe area, okay? I know all things are relative, but it's a safe safe area. So this, there's a lot to, and got great programs, great faculty, and great fellow students. So there's a lot to offer here, okay? And I think that's what, that's what needs to be promoted at a national level. Repairing the relationship with faculty. Um, certainly, one would be myopic if they didn't see that from the outside. Um, I will tell you that uh, uh, I know there's an ongoing issue relative to developing and fully developing the Constitution because at the moment there's a, that formal relationship that many campuses have in terms of defining what shared governance is um, that, both side, that both sides can trust and work, you know, work that process. You don't have that in place yet. And um, I understand it's in process to, to get there. I will do whatever I can. I know there's a, a limited role the president would have to play, <clears throat> but do what I can to see that, to help shepherd that towards com completion. I think it's important that both faculty and administration have a set of guidelines, I guess you call a constitution, um, that defines how, that, how we work together. 
uh, <clears throat> beyond that in starting day one, probably starting before day one, if I were to be fortunate to come here, is I'm, you're going to see me. I'm going to be out there. I'm going to be talking to faculty groups. If faculty are gathering in the in this building or somewhere over a third, gathering for coffee, I'm going to sit, coffee. I'm going to sit down with you. I'm going to talk to you. I'm going to I'm going to work with faculty. Um, that's that's what I do best. I'm kind of known for that. Uh, I involve faculty in a variety of ways in decision making processes. Um, in our case, sorry. In in our case, we have what we call our bylaws, which is kind of your your constitution equivalent. Montana State used the term faculty handbook. It's the same idea. Um, there were formal rules of how you engage faculty to provide input. I will look at a lot of informal ways in which uh, it could be focus groups, town halls, um, even just coming out to the house. I invite people to the house to have, you know, let's have, have some light food and refreshments at the end of the day and talk about some subject. Those kinds of things I would institute as soon as possible because I think getting folks engaged um, just in the conversation of where do we, how are we going to get going for, how are we going to keep our momentum, move forward, resolve the issues that that have um, that have um, chased us down to this point, get that get that fully resolved, uh, but move forward from there. So that's how I would uh, approach it. I'm sure, a lot more detail will have to come out, but that's a quick answer for you. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So you. Do they need the mic? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you for. All those, sh the ships at sea, everyone around the world watching this. <laughs> Hello, people of the world and the internet. Um, so you mentioned these millions of dollars in support that you, I guess, insured for Montana State. And then you also mentioned that Idaho State needs more private support. And so I guess I was wondering what your plan was or why you would be the best fit to secure that same kind of support for Idaho State. Well, I mentioned, well, first of all, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Idaho State will have to most assuredly rely upon more private support. The state, keep in mind, the state of Idaho, like most states today, in fact, all that I know of, um, the higher education budget resides in a small and shrinking discretionary part of the budget. You've got Medicaid, you have... Um, a number of other things that are fixed price that the, that takes up an ever larger portion of the state budget. What's left K-12 is usually a part of that because they're formula-based. Most of the time, higher education comes out of the discretionary part. It's shrinking. And there's a lot of things that legislators want to do, that citizens want to do through the legislature. So um, that trend is not going to change, okay? And so Hopefully the the economy grows and there's more money, but at the same time, it's going to be it's going to be a lot of competition for those dollars. So we have to look at other sources of revenue. So student that's why student growth is important because when we're declining enrollments, this is a huge part of our general budget. Okay, and when student enrollment is declining, that that's when the business officers and the including the president say, hey, this is this is hurting us. Okay, so we have to shore up that and, and grow our grow our student enrollments and grow it in a smart way so that, that we can recapture that, but also look at private support for things that uh, that we want to do that are going to be above and beyond what the state could realistically do for us. So many new facilities, um, maybe equipment, um, professorships, yeah, endowed professorships, those are going to be the kinds of things that individuals, when we can get them excited about what we're doing, they want to help because another great asset that Idaho State enjoys is very loyal alumni. And in fact, I've I've heard from some of you before that say, you know, you're the my father and mother were alumni, and 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 so that's a wonderful legacy. You know, many institutions wish they had that, and so they want to help. They just want to see the vision. They want to see the the future. They want to see the stability. And so that's that's what I've had experience at doing. Okay, I'm confident I could do it here. I'm confident many people who have, you know, can do this would be successful here. It's a matter of putting it all together. So that's what I would look to be doing to, to assist. Thank you. <laughs> Looks like you drew the next short straw <laughs> to ask the question. So I actually have two questions for you. Um, the first one. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a quick draw. There you go. Oh, there we go. Perfect. So the first one. So I'm actually born and raised here in Pocatello. 
and I feel like there's a huge disconnect from ISU in the community. Yeah. And then my second question, what do you find, I guess, in a way of having like fun with students? Like how do you interact and have fun with the students overall? Great, great so questions. We, so yes, and I've become aware of this. And, and in fact, it's hard not to read anything and you hear conversations about um, the, the relationship between the community and, and uh, the institution. That's one that uh, is, is critical because, put in perspective, the university has a number of constituents. Constituents are key players in shaping the future and stability of the institution. Certainly, students, faculty, staff, okay, constituents, alumni, um, and then, then you get into the public, okay? And I, I always kind of, you can break down the public into elected officials, okay, and there's importance there. And, and um, the public at large has an interest in what you're doing, but certainly the, the immediate community is a huge constituent. They will be a constituent that, as at large, they will be a constituent of mine, okay, because it's critical that we have relate. We need to have that, that support we need, and, and I'm going to assure them, I'll get to see some of those folks later today, to assure them of the two-way street. Part of what we're trying to build here is it's using the euphemism of uh, building a national reputation. I say euphemism, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a process by which the outcomes are benefits to this community. Okay, With greater research, for example, we're going to see more spinoffs, more companies, more jobs coming here. Certainly, I think our community leaders would enjoy that. Our community, and students can stay here, okay? Who choose to, and some may not. Some obviously will go elsewhere. But the opportunity to stay here would be a draw, I think, for many students. So that's, you know, that's one reason why it's important that we do what we do even better. But maintaining those relationships, I'm gonna tell the folks this afternoon as well that they'll see me and my, and my wife. We're members of the community. Um, we'll go to events. We're gonna, you're going to see us at, at places. You'll see us in hiking the hills. You'll see us doing a lot of things like that. Um, and I'm going to invite them, just like I mentioned a minute ago, I'm going to invite them to our home too, to, to the leaders and whoever you know, reasonably fit in. I don't, I don't have a home, right? But whomever we can reasonably fit in um, to come and, and really get a part of, because the president is, a, is an embodiment of the institution. Okay, that's something that, you know, it's hard for me to say. It sounds like I'm talking kind of third person here. But that's who the, the community looks to the president to be, is that embodiment of the university. And so when they can talk to the president, they feel like they're talking to the university. And you, and you really are. And so and so I will be that conduit of information. So I, I think they just have to build trust there, and they have to see me. If, you know, and I used the term earlier today of management by walking around. I, I was referring to campus, but I'll kind of go around the community as well. You'll see me in places. I'll, uh, if if I were to be fortunate to come here, probably one of the first business persons I'm going to meet is a new car dealer because my old truck needs to be replaced. So I'm going <laughs> to need to go there too. So hopefully that answers your your question. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned your other previous leadership experience, such as um, dean of student six or. Vice President of Student Success right. and Dean of the College of Engineering. And all these leadership positions, I feel like, are relatively narrow in focus. And so how will you take the skills that you learned in these more narrow positions and apply them to the broad focus that you need to run sure. an entire university? Um, I would argue that the uh, probably the most narrow of the positions I've held right now or would have been the Vice President for Student Success and Provost. Because they, they have, now Provost, depends on how you look at it, is very broad, but it's mostly campus focused, okay? Um, student success, again, fairly narrow related to student programming, but I had 1,400 employees, okay? <laughs> Many students like yourself, okay, who were uh, part-time employees, ranging from the dorms to, to athletics and everything in between. Um, Dean, on the other hand, was a job and, and it was specifically given to me this way when I became dean, and as I was given that expectation, I need to increase my external profile. Because that's what deans do, yeah, to increase your external profile. In other words, fundraise, okay, do those kinds of things. Not only fundraising, but um, 
developing external relations with employers, developing external relations with uh, individuals or rather companies that may want to um, buy into some of our research product, technology transfer, all of that. And so I've talked to a number. One of the things I did on my AC fellowship is I got a chance to talk to about a total, total of 30 different university presidents around the country at different times throughout that year. They all said, well, those that had served in that capacity, they said the job that prepared them the most for the position of president was being a dean because, because it had that external relationship. So it's not, it wasn't quite as narrow as you may be thinking because um, you, you may see the dean as what you see it as a student, but they have a, they have a fairly broad portfolio and it's getting broader. And, and so I'm not saying that that makes me perfectly qualified. I'm just saying that that and other experiences, um, and, and it's the job that I had the longest, as I said earlier. And, and so definitely the president has an external portfolio, pardon the expression, and you have to have a, a, a meet those constituencies that we talked about, many external, uh, certainly internal. And so I see the next president, Idaho State, is gonna have to focus a little bit internally for a while, but then you know we have to do those external things as well. Hope that helps answer your question. Here we go. Hi. How Hello. Um, so I just want to refocus back to a question that was asked earlier about like what you would like to do with have fun with students, oh, and then I'm sorry, I two. Missed that. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's okay. It's just something that we're curious about, is all. Yeah. And then two, what is your leadership style? So I know they're not really similar, okay. but those are good. Too. You'll have sometimes forgive me because uh, multi-part questions. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> I get lost. So I, and it was a and I. It was the fun part of the question. I forgot to just go there. So let me let me share with you a little bit of experience. When I was dean, <clears throat> I actually served as the uh, uh, assistant. I was the assistant coach for the baseball team. Okay, I started when I was associate dean. Then I became dean. I kept doing it for as long as I could. Now they had what the that's the reason Brian I asked about whether or not there was a baseball team here. <clears throat> I have a great passion. Well, I think you do, because we played in that same league. There, there's an intercollegiate club sport, okay? And that's and that's and and we had restarted it at Montana State. A colleague of mine restarted it and asked me to help out. And so um, I said, and I'm, I'm a passionate about baseball, and I said, great, I'd have, love to help. And so I got to know a lot of the students that way. And and uh, now, I know it's a, it's a narrow group, <laughs> speaking of being narrow. But uh, that was among the kinds of things I did. I've also gone on uh, trips with um, some of our design teams. At Missouri S&T, we have a lot of great uh, design teams, such as the motorsports. Um, there's uh, solar car competitions. They have a Mars rover competition in southern Utah. And I've attended many of those with our students along the way. And so those are, I consider them fun. I don't know if they think I'm fun being there. I guess I, I think so. But uh, but I I... I will tell you that's one of the things I miss about being a dean and I miss about being a faculty member is working more regularly with students. And I will I'll end with this by saying I'm committed to as a president, I don't want to get too far away from students because I'm, I'm sure it's easy to do. I know presidents or I've known of presidents who have, it's an executive job, you do your executive job and you know, the, the basic mass out there you kind of you can lose sight of if it's easy to do. But I, I'm, I'm hopeful not to do that. Um, part two of your question was my leadership style. Thank you. So I, I refer to the servant, um, servant leader style. Okay. That there, there's a kind of a school of thought there. It means different things to different people. Basically, I view my job as serving you. Um, that's my primary focus is what can I do to make you successful? Okay. And what you need to be successful is to have great faculty. Okay and great facilities and great great other amenities of the university. Uh, and, that's, and that's what I'm focused on trying to provide. Yes, there's a leadership capacity there. And I, and I focus on my leadership capacity is I'm trying to empower others to, to do that. So there's some needs that you may have that is you know, kind of central to one particular area. The president may not be in a great position to, to help it you know, personally, so I'm, I'm going to empower as many people as I can to, to be there to make sure that you have what you need to be successful, and likewise for faculty and, and staff. 
And so that's that's kind of a real simplistic uh, embodiment of the of the servant leader model. I'm a consensus builder. I'm a partnership builder. Um, I'm pretty known for that. And and I think uh, for, you were part of any reference calls, Jessica. But that's part of what uh, I know some people that they talk to, and and that's what I've that's what my career has been embodied about. I'm I'm an interdisciplinary person by nature. I collaborate across colleges. I collaborate across institutions. And, and in my, my personal cabinet that I have, I should say my personal cabinet, the cabinet that reports to me, um, what I've done historically is, is uh, I work with that group. I empower them to do what they need to be doing. I'm here to help. And they always have issues they can, they can help with. But I don't need to, they don't need to come to me for permission on everything. Okay, because that slows things down and it's unnecessary. If you hire great people, let them do their job most of the time you're going to be successful, okay? And I always tell people don't, you know, because the risk you run is is someone running down a path that they think is the right thing to do, but, but something went awry and they didn't bother to bring it to my attention. And now it's out of control and we got we got to rein it back in. So that's a risk, but I always tell people, always tell me what you're up to. If you think there's risk of something, let me know so that I can address it, help you address it and bring in whatever resources necessary at that time. So I'll just lastly say consensus is a big thing for me, but consensus is not 100% agreement, okay? And I think you'll find this in your professional lives, probably in your lives that you lead right now. It just means that that you've been heard, you know, and, and that my cabinet, I like, I like having folks kind of go back and forth and say, here's pro, con, why we should, why we shouldn't. Um, give us, you know, give us those different opinions. But at the end of the day, we got to reach a decision. And what I want people to walk away with is comfortable that they were heard and that their input was considered. Even if they may not agree personally with the decision made, they can support it because they knew the rationale went in behind it. And I know, I know that's simple to say, and it's harder to practice, but I've been reasonably successful at that. And I, it's a bit of an art. So that's, that's how I would answer your question. Yeah. You look like you had a question. That's not actually a student. May I ask? No, please, question? please. Sorry, if anyone has a question, actually, I, I assume. Question. Okay, sure. Thank you. So, you started off asking me who I was. I'm, <laughs> I was just using an example, yeah. and I apologize for that. I'm a second year PhD spot. student in physics. Mm -hmm. In 2012, we had 13 full time faculty. We are down to five. We lost two people in the two years I've been here, okay. and one of the lines for one of those people got transferred to computer science. Mm -hmm. I already asked about what you can do about enrollment, mm -hmm. and I understand that that is a central part of the issue, but let me ask a question, possibly a couple steps below your pay grade as president. What could you do? What would you do to get the fact to get the physics department back to its glory day of having an adequately staffed yeah. department? Well, I, I will tell you uh, to kind of work to the from the last year question to the front, so to speak, is I think every one of our programs that we want that we have it at at, at uh, ISU needs to be very effective, very top drawer. That's what I want the best program possible. So I want a healthy physics department. I think having a subpar physics department, I'm not saying it is, I'm just hypothetically speaking, no, none of our academic programs can afford to be subpar because it doesn't serve the institution well, it doesn't serve the state well. I don't know what the right number is and I'm not gonna sit here and second guess the decision that was made to move these positions out. I'm sure it was not an easy decision. Um, certainly I would look to what can we do to, to build that program forward and, and student enrollment is going to be a part of it, yes. And I would assume student enrollment in physics. Uh, I think there's still a lot of work to be done there. I don't think that we solved all the problems, as, as I'm sure you know. And, and so what can we do to, to rebuild that? And, and even, even in kind of interim stages of, of faculty that can, can work, you know, kind of teach in physics, maybe do research in physics, maybe they have homes elsewhere, um, this notion of cross-pollinization, I'll look at some of that too, because that may be a, stage of getting to where we need to go. So I don't know what the right number is. Um, again, I, I can't second guess the, the how you've gotten from, what did you say, the you referred to the glory days. I don't know what, how many were there at that time. 13. 13. 
Yeah, that's that's a seems like a large drop, and I, um, like I said, I'm sure it was not easy. Um, I can't say what if it gets back to 13 or gets back to some number that makes it a very uh, high quality program. That's what I'll be looking at. Did you? <laughs> yeah, I, they'll they'll veto you if if not. <laughs> Just realize you can actually move. Yeah, I, I thought it was important to identify myself as not a student, as it might not be apparent to you. That's okay. Um, yeah, actually, I kind of a question related to one of the ones asked earlier. So um, I'm actually in the English department, and um, so most of your background has come, and I'm here because I can't go to the four o'clock thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, uh, so much of your background is in science and technology and engineering, and I wondered if you could speak to the other areas of the of the mm -hmm. university and um, and it effectively, you know, leading the entire university and and how you see those different areas kind Absolutely. of balancing. Absolutely. By the way, I want to make sure. When are we? I want to make sure my timekeeper is with me. When are we done? Okay. So I, I got a couple minutes. It sounds like okay. Um, th well, thanks for the question, and and um, I've I've said several times already today that I, um, yes, you know you know my CV, you know my background. Um, one thing that's maybe easily overlooked is that my bachelor's degree in general studies actually had a minor in applied or excuse me in experimental psychology, and um, and that led to my interest in human factors engineering and ultimately into engineering proper. So I, I have a, I, I consider myself having a liberal arts background. Actually, I think it served me extremely well. Okay, and and my uh, I've told this joke probably too many times already today, but uh, uh, a great colleague of mine once told me, who was a non-engineer, said, you know, engineering is not really a profession; it's a personality disorder. So, um, <laughs> and. Usually it gets a couple of chuckles when I say that, if you know a few engineers. And I say that, and, it, and, I, and my engineering colleagues laugh the hardest oftentimes. The, the issue is that, that um, I came into the disorder, I developed that disorder later in life, okay, as, as it were. So I, but I feel like that breadth of training that I had, even though it was kind of aimed at studying a particular problem, I didn't set out to be an engineer with a broad training. It was just kind of what is what happened, okay, by happenstance. But I was studying a particular problem, and I found that my background was well suited to that. And yeah, I had to come back and complete the calculus series and do all that stuff that at a at slightly older age, well, not that old, but a slightly older age. And and uh, yeah, I made it through, but but it was worth it, and I have enjoyed my career since then. But uh, I've. I like the robustness. I like the feel of a comprehensive campus. And, and I know concerns that folks have is, you know, you, or people like me get asked questions such as, you know, where does the traditional liberal arts uh, curricula fit into a modern university? And I said, it fits in where it's always fit. It's the rock bottom. I'm sorry, rock bottom. It's the, the foundation of, sorry, I almost came out bad. Um, no one else heard it. Uh, it's the foundation of what we do. Okay, and and I and I have been throughout my career as an engineering administrator made sure that it didn't slip because trust me, I've had engineering faculty tell me, well, ABET says we got to add this, so therefore we need to drop the this this humanities course. And I said no, <laughs> and by the way, that's not what ABET said. Okay, and for, ABET is the accrediting agency for engineering, and 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 so. Engineering professions today are built upon a foundation of liberal arts and sciences, but you become the professional that you do. So I'm committed to that, and and I, as I said a minute ago, I'm committed to every program on this campus be as high quality as possible. Not everyone's starting out at the same place today. Some have achieved some really national prominence. Others are struggling. I want to see everyone increase. I want to see all the boats rise. Otherwise, we shouldn't be doing it. Well, this has been very energetic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> and uh, off to the next stop. Thanks for coming. <laughs>